Well, before we read God's word, let's pray once again. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can meditate on your word, and we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would open our hearts to uh, understand it and uh, to trust your word, to believe it, and uh, to not only trust but also obey and live a life of, of obedience and submission to you and your word uh, out of thankfulness for uh, such amazing grace that we've been given in Christ. Help us to, to know that you are our good and gracious Father and Almighty God, and um, help us now as we meditate on uh, this doctrine of providence. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to grab a copy of God's Word and turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 104. We'll have two scripture readings. One will be Psalm 104, which we just sang, and then we'll have a New Testament reading uh, in Romans 8. So read a portion of Psalm 104. Our text will be uh, Psalm 104 and verses 24 through 32. So Psalm 104 and verses 24 to 32, let's give our attention to God's holy and errant inspired word. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. And then turn me over to Romans chapter 8. And I'll read from Romans 8 and verses 28 to 30. Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. Let's again give our attention to God's Word. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. As far as the reading of God's holy word, may he bless it to our hearts this afternoon. I'd also invite you to grab a copy of the uh, Forms and Prayers book, probably in the chair in front of you there. And uh, turn with me to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 10, which we'll be considering this afternoon. And that can be found on uh, page 211, 211. Lord's Day 10, and there's two questions and answers on this Lord's Day, and I'll ask the question, and then we'll all respond together uh, with the answer. What do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God, by which God upholds, as with His hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. How does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father 
that no creature will separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. Amen. Well, perhaps you've uh, heard another Christian uh, tell you an amazing story and uh, that's hard to explain you know, how this could happen uh, in such a good and wonderful way. And uh, they say to you, it was a total God thing. Maybe you've said that. It was a total, it, this was a total God thing. Um, or maybe you've said it before. Uh, what we learn from the Bible really is that everything is a God thing in some sense. Now, we understand what people mean by that when they say that, right? Um, it's a happy providence, a good thing that we're thankful to God for, and we don't need to, you know, really, you know, correct their theology in that moment. Um, but we want to understand when we say things like that, or other people say things like that, that really, ultimately, everything is a God thing in some sense. In other words, the God who created the world out of nothing by His Word and Spirit continues to uphold and govern all things by His Word and Spirit. And even of the boring, ordinary, everyday routine things that we expect that don't surprise us in any way, uh, we can say of those things, it's a, it was a God thing. As Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 11, he says that in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things, not some things, but who works all things according to the counsel of His will. And so all things are a God thing in some sense. God upholds and governs His creation. And as uh, R.C. Sproul used to say, there is not one maverick molecule in all of creation that God is not sovereign over. And we call this the doctrine of providence. But what is providence? Maybe you've wondered, what, what is that, where does that word even come from? Providence, uh, this word comes from a Latin word, providentia, which originally meant foresight, uh, but it's gradually acquired other meanings. Uh, and theologically, when we speak of providence, providence is God's sovereign power in preserving and governing all things. And I love the beautiful statement of our catechism when it says in answer 27, it's the almighty and ever-present power of God by which He upholds, as with His hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, rain and sunshine. All things, in fact, come to us not by chance, not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. All things come to us not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. It's a beautiful answer, isn't it? Um, in other words, God is ultimately in control, not you, not me not the forces of nature, not uh, the earthly rulers of this world, not Satan. God is in control. God preserves and governs all things in creation. And as we consider this doctrine this afternoon, we'll consider then three facets of providence. And then secondly, three fruits of providence. So three facets of providence and then three fruits of providence. So first... The three facets of providence. Uh, the first facet of providence is God's preservation of His creation. God's preservation of His creation. And here we confess that the scriptures, what the scriptures teach, namely that God continues to preserve or uphold or sustain His creation. And if God ever stopped preserving us and all that exists, we would immediately return to nothing. We'd immediately go back to Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, and that's it. Only God would exist. No longer would all of reality be two, creator and creation. All of reality would be one, God, our triune God, would be all that exists. <laughs> and so isn't that a humbling and profound thought? And we see this taught all throughout the Bible. But just a few
few scripture passages I'll give you where we see that God preserves his creation. Psalm 104, we just read and, and sang, it says, these creatures, they all look to you, speaking of God, they all look to God, to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You see, all of creation is dependent on God for food and breath, life, and all good things. If He takes it away, we don't have it. If He gives it to us, we have it and we rejoice. But He is sovereignly preserving and sustaining His creation. Nehemiah 9 verse 6 says, you are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, speaking of creation, and then adds, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so this is the first facet of providence that we speak of when we talk about this doctrine, is that God, he preserves, he sustains, he upholds all of his creation. He continues to do that. He didn't just create it and then leave it be. No, he continues to sustain and uphold it. One theologian, Louis Burkhoff, said, preservation may be defined as that continuous work of God by which He maintains the things which He created, together with the properties and powers with which He endowed them. So that's the first facet of providence, God's preservation of His creation. The second facet of providence is God's government of His creation. Again, the Bible teaches this everywhere as well, but I'll just give you some representative passages that God, that our triune God is sovereign and governs all things. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all. In Daniel 4, this is after Nebuchadnezzar had his sanity had returned to him. You may remember Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. He looks, at, uh, looks out at his kingdom and he says, Wow, look at all this that I've built and done. Aren't I the greatest most powerful person in the universe. <laughs> and God says, nope, and uh, strikes him with an insanity. And he ends up, uh, you know, being like a beast of the field. His fingernails get all long like talons, and he's eating with the beasts of the fields. He's, his hair's getting long. He's, he's, he's like an animal. And, uh, and then it says in Daniel 4, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, he's finally humbled by this, I lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever, for His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and He does according to His will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay His hand or say to Him, what have you done? You see, he confessed in that moment that God is sovereign. He rules. He governs his creation. One last scripture, 1 Timothy 6, 15, it says, it's a doxology that says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And so we see here in these representative texts, and many more can be given, that God rules. He, he governs His creation. And the Bible teaches that in some sense God ordains everything that comes to pass. Now I say in some sense because people tend to think that when we say God ordains everything that comes to pass, that that means that He works in the exact same way in every instance. But that's not the case. God can work both directly and indirectly. He can work actively and passively, in other words, allowing something to happen. He can heal you, for example, of your disease through a miracle, 
or through medicine. The Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 5, says this, that God in His ordinary providence makes use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at His pleasure. And so we need to recognize that when we say God ordains all things that come to pass, that it's in some sense. In other words, He doesn't do everything exactly the same way. He can work directly or indirectly, actively, passively. He often works through means. And God is no less to be praised when He works through ordinary means than when He works directly and miraculously. We ought to praise Him not only for the miracle of healing, if He should do that, but also praise Him when He heals us, when we got a good night's sleep and the medicine worked for us, and we thank Him for healing us in that way. He ultimately should get the glory. Uh, we, we praise Him when He works through ordinary means. So another example, uh, you know, God is to be praised for the amazing solar eclipse everyone was in awe of this past week. How many of you guys saw that solar eclipse this past week? Hopefully your eyes are doing okay. Maybe at least saw, I'm sure you heard about it and saw it on social media, on the news, right? But uh, God is to be praised for that. The heavens declare the glory of our God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Uh, I saw this uh, great quote on social media this week from a guy named R.L. Solberg, and he said this. He said, an eclipse is a cosmic reminder that the universe is not a random collection of matter and events that happen by chance. The cosmos is so finely tuned that we can know precisely where every heavenly body will be 200 years from now, down to the minute. These events remind us that the universe is not an accident, and neither are we. God made both, and He is in control. Amen? He's in control. And it's important that we realize that he's, he's actively working not only in the things that we might think are significant, but even in the seemingly insignificant things. As our Lord taught in Matthew 10, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Right? This sparrow that's sold for a penny? We don't even have pennies in Canada anymore. <laughs> I think you still have them here. Um, these seemingly insignificant birds, they'll fall to the ground, and even they don't fall to the ground apart from our Heavenly Father's will. And he says, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. And he says, fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And so even the seemingly insignificant things are God is ruling over and uh, ordaining and God is also at work in the things that seem to be a, that just seem to be a coincidence or or luck or accidental. And it's okay to use those words, but we need to understand that ultimately it happens according to God's ordination. So Proverbs sixteen thirty three says that the, that the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And so when you roll dice in a game of Yahtzee, every decision is of the Lord. When you uh, flip a coin, every decision is ultimately of the Lord. It appears to us as if it's just you know, chance from a human perspective, but it's all according to God's foreordained plan. And so there's absolutely nothing outside of God's sovereign will. Nothing slips past Him. Nothing catches Him by surprise. He knows all things. He upholds all things, and He governs all things. And while this can cause some people a great deal of consternation. The Bible everywhere unashamedly affirms this and praises God for this. In other words, we're not victims of chance. All things happen according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, as Paul said in Ephesians 1. Or as the Puritan uh, Thomas Watson once put it, God is not like an artificer that builds a house and then leaves it. But like a pilot, he steers the ship of the whole creation. And so, these are the first two facets of providence, that God's, God's preservation of his creation, and secondly, God's government of his creation. 
But the third facet that we want to talk about and that theologians often discuss is God's cooperation with his creation, sometimes referred to as divine concurrence or uh, concursus in Latin. And uh, this is the idea that God doesn't treat everything in creation like a puppet. Rather, God governs them in such a way that they also freely make decisions according to their nature, and humans remain responsible for their actions. Now, the struggle that we often have with the doctrine of providence is when it comes to evil and suffering in the world, right? Some have a hard time embracing providence because they say, if God is sovereign and in control of all things, and people commit evil acts, then how can we not say that God is the author of evil? Well, here's what we confess uh, in Belgian Confession of Faith, Article 13. We confess that nevertheless, God neither is the author of nor can be charged with the sins which are committed. For His power and goodness are so great and incomprehensible that He ordains and executes His work in the most excellent and just manner, even then when devils and wicked men act unjustly. And so this is what we confess, and we confess that based on God's Word, because the Bible clearly teaches us that God is sovereign, as we've just seen, and it clearly teaches that God is good. Jesus says in Matthew 19, there is only one who is good, referring to God. James 1.17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Ultimately, God is perfectly good and the overflowing fountain of all good. He's, he cannot do anything sinful or evil. And so God is both sovereign and good. The Scriptures clearly teach that. And they clearly teach that man is also responsible for his sinful actions. And we see this incomprehensible mystery of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility uh, clearly in the story of Joseph. In, remember the story of Joseph, right? His brothers sold him into slavery, and uh, he spent all those years in, in uh, slavery, and uh, he, you know, was a servant in the Potiphar's house and rose in the ranks, and so Potiphar's wife uh, set him up, and then he gets thrown in jail, and he spends 14 years in jail, like the first seven, uh, he's hoping to get out, but then the, you know, the guys that were in there with him forget about him, so he spends another seven years, he spends all that time in prison, so eventually, he's the only one able to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams, and so he comes to the Pharaoh and he interprets his dreams, and, and uh, God uses him uh, to save a great many people through a famine. And so eventually, his brothers have to come down to Egypt to get food, not knowing that he's the Pharaoh's right-hand man, and uh, eventually, they find out that it's... Joseph, this is the guy, this is our brother we sold in the slave for like 20 years ago, and now he's the Pharaoh's right-hand man? He surely is going to chop our heads off. <laughs> and do you remember what Joseph says to them? He says, as a type of Christ, he forgives them, and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You see, they were responsible. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Not only so that all these people could survive and continue to have temporal life, but ultimately so that the Messiah could come and bring us eternal life. And so that's the doctrine of divine concurrence. We see the same truth of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility in the cross of Jesus Christ. In Peter's uh, Pentecost sermon in Acts 2, he proclaims to all these Jews that are there, he says, this Jesus, who was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He's speaking of the cross. He was delivered up on the cross according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And he says, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You see, God is sovereign and he's good. And they were wicked and evil in what they did. But God had a good and sovereign plan. So 
The Bible teaches that God's power and goodness are so great that He is able to ordain all things in such a way that He does not turn us into puppets. Rather, He remains both sovereign and good, and we remain responsible for our own evil actions. Now, this is a great mystery we cannot fully comprehend in our finite minds. And I realize that some object to this in various ways. Some say, well, that doesn't make sense, or it doesn't seem fair. An all-good and all-powerful God can't exist in a world where evil exists. And I understand these objections. But here we have to be content with mystery. We have to be content with mystery and trust God's Word. Because the Bible clearly teaches that God is all-powerful and all-good. And He's in no way the author of evil, which is a blasphemous thought. And it clearly reveals that man is responsible for his actions. And really, what it comes down to is that there is a hidden premise in the argument that an all-powerful and all-good God cannot exist in a world where evil exists. There's a hidden premise in that argument. And the hidden premise is this, that God doesn't have any good reasons to allow evil to exist. Now, one can assert that, we can assert that, but we can't prove that. And so we must trust that He ultimately has a good reason for allowing evil and suffering to exist. And He is infinitely wise and just and good and knows all things. And we need to trust Him even when it doesn't seem like He could have any good reason for allowing certain things to happen. I mean, we, even from our own human experience, we know that, that sometimes there is a good reason for allowing suffering. So for example, one of our daughters used to suck on a pacifier. And at one point, we had to stop giving it to her. You didn't see her wear, you know, come in here at church today with a pacifier in her mouth. Um, but Because at some point, we had to stop giving it to her. And why is that? Well, for several reasons, but one was that we had just met with our dentist, and our dentist told us we needed to stop giving it to her, because if she continued sleeping with it as she grew up, it would harm her teeth, and they would not look nice, right? She'd have this overbite, and she'd be like Bucky, you know, <laughs> with the buck teeth, and uh, we didn't want her to be made fun of one day, and, and not look nice, and have unhealthy teeth. And so we had to wean her off the pacifier, we had to wean her off that pacifier, and was that process pleasant for her? No. And she didn't understand it either. She thought we were depriving her of something good and were causing her unnecessary and pointless suffering. But we were doing it for her greater good so that she wouldn't suffer in a much greater way later in life. Now, I realize that there is far more serious suffering going on in the world today. But just because we can't think of how any good can come out of it doesn't mean that in the all-knowing, infinitely wise mind of God that there can't possibly be any good purpose behind it. As Timothy Keller once put it, to insist that if we can't come up with a good reason, then one can't possibly exist in the mind of God is ridiculous. The belief that because we cannot think of something, God cannot think of it either, is more than a fallacy. It is a mark of great pride and faith in one's own mind. That's what it comes down to. It's ultimately worshiping ourselves, worshiping our own finite minds, putting our place, putting ourselves in the place of God. And as one theologian put it, instead of cringing at the criticisms leveled by unbelievers, we should confront them with the consequences of their own alternatives. They need to own up to their own world and life view. What security or stability can be found in a world which operates on the basis of random activity or fate? Apart from a sovereign creator, how can we explain the existence of the laws of nature? What happens to human dignity when we deny that man is the image of God? If we live in a world that is merely the result of chance, why should we get out of bed in the morning, go to school? Seek employment, get married, or raise a family. And so here, at the end of the day, we ultimately have to be content with mystery and trust God's word that he's both sovereign and good, and that he has a good reason 
behind all that happens. As Deuteronomy 29, 21, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but that which is revealed are for us and our children. Or as Paul exclaims in Romans eleven thirty three, 33, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable are His ways. In other words, there are just some things that are above our pay grade, if you will, right? We have to be content with mystery. And so we confess to our own eternal comfort that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. And so what is providence? Providence is God's sovereign power in preserving and governing all things. And we've seen these three facets, but then briefly let's consider then how it applies to our life. In our second point, three fruits of providence. First fruit, the providence of God helps us, as our catechism puts it, to be patient in adversity to be patient in adversity. You see, if God is in control, and if God is good, then we can be patient in every circumstance, even the awkward ones, even the painful ones, even the frustrating ones, <laughs> even when we don't get our way, even when we're sick, even when we're grieving, we can be patient knowing that He can and will turn it to our ultimate good. It may be painful for a moment. It may be painful our entire life before we go to heaven to be with our Lord. But when we reach heaven, God will wipe away every tear from our eye, and we will look back, and then we will realize that it was all for our ultimate good. You can think of it like a, a tapestry, right? You've seen maybe a tapestry before, a beautiful almost looks like a rug, right? But beautiful artwork that's sewn into that tapestry. Uh, but then have you ever looked at the backside? It's, it's, it's not as pretty, right? You can hardly make any sense out of it. it. may even look a little ugly to you from the backside. Well, you could think of all of history as like a tapestry. But God sees the beautiful side and what He's doing in history to glorify His name and for the good of His people. And we're here down below and we see the backside right? And it can be confusing. We say, what is that all about? But then when we get to heaven, then He will reveal to us the beautiful masterpiece He's been doing to glorify His name for our ultimate good, because those things go together. Now, to be clear, the pain that we face in this life is genuine pain. If we cry tears of pain and sorrow, it's, it's not as though we've had to set aside our doctrine of providence, and we're not trusting in God's providence in those times we're crying. Jesus Himself was a crier. It says in Hebrews 5 that in the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication, not with little cries, but loud cries and tears, to Him who was able to save Him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. You see, that wasn't seen as a lack of trust in God's providence. It was seen as a reverence for God. So you see, the doctrine of providence doesn't say that you have to be like a stoic and just suck it up and tough it out. No. It says you can cry, you can grieve, but cry with tears of hope. Don't cry as those as the world cries, as those who have no hope. You and I know that there is coming a day when God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And that's our hope. You see, being patient in adversity is all about the, the big picture, which is why Romans 8.28 is so comforting. He's, it says again there, that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. 
You see, none of your pain or suffering will ever be wasted in God's providence. It's all being used for your ultimate good and His glory. And as we go through adversity, we, of course, have to look to Jesus. Our greatest assurance that God is good and is able to make all things work together for our good is found in the cross of Christ. Because the cross, if you think about it, is the greatest evil that we could ever imagine, the death of the only Son of God. But God used it to bring about the greatest possible good, the salvation of His people for the glory of His name. And so surely He can turn whatever sufferings and pain you go through in this life for your ultimate good one day. You see, the answer to the problem of evil is not ultimately a philosophical argument, but a historical fact. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, died for our sins. He rose again from the dead. That's a historical fact, and He's coming again. That's the answer. That's God's answer to the problem of evil. Here is my Son. Look to Him for hope and salvation. And so when you feel forsaken by God in your sufferings and are tempted to ask that question, why have you forsaken me? All I can ultimately do is point you to Jesus on the cross where he cried out, my God, my God, oh, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken in your place so that you will never be forsaken by God, ever. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief to save you from the sorrows and grief of this world when he returns. He suffered hell in your place so that you will never know what it's like ultimately to go through hell. Think about that. When we all get to heaven, there's only going to be one person there who suffered hell. And that's Jesus. We'll praise Him for that. He suffered God's wrath in our place so that now God looks upon you and me with eternal favor and blessing in Christ. And so look to Jesus to find the pattern and power to be patient in adversity What adversity are you going through right now that you need to be patient in and and trust God's providence? Let us be patient in adversity and trust our Heavenly Father's good and wise plan. Charles Spurgeon once said, When we cannot trace His hand, when we cannot trace His hand, we must trust His heart. And we see God's loving heart most clearly at the cross. Well, second and more briefly, the providence of God helps us to be thankful in prosperity. Not only patient in adversity, but thankful in prosperity. I mean, how often do we depend on the doctrine of providence when we're going through trials and tribulations and we pray to God to deliver us from those things and then forget all about providence and and God's uh, providence when we are prospering? How often do we ask God for safe travels or for healing or a job, and then we never get around to thanking God when He provides those things for us? Well, let's not forget to thank God at all times. Let us be thankful for our food. Let us be thankful for the clothes we wear, our car, our job, our home, and all the blessings we sang. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And remember, God can heal you of your disease through a miracle or through medicine. Regardless, thank Him for healing. He can make bread uh, just appear on your table, if it's His will, just by speaking the word. Don't count on it. (laughs) Or He can put bread on your table through those who fulfill their daily callings as farmers and truck drivers and grocery store workers and store clerks. Regardless, thank God for your daily bread, ultimately and those who help to get it there. When you pray for protection, God could put a force field around you, and wouldn't that be cool? He could do that. Or He can give you police officers and military and and so forth. Either way, thank Him for whatever protection that you enjoy. And so what what present prosperity are you thankful to God for this day? Let us thank our Heavenly Father for all the good gifts that come to us by His fatherly hand. And so we are called to be patient in prosperity and, uh, I'm sorry, patient in adversity and thankful in prosperity. And third, this is the third fruit of the doctrine of providence that our catechism highlights. The providence of God helps us to be confident about the future, right? We often struggle with worrying about the future, don't we? Some of us especially are worry warts. And uh, does does worrying help? I remember a a movie that Tom Hanks starred in, perhaps you've seen it, it's called Bridge of Spies, 
and Tom Hanks plays an American lawyer who was recruited during the Cold War to defend an arrested Soviet spy. He's to defend him in court and then help the CIA facilitate an exchange of the spy for a Soviet-captured American U-2 spy plane pilot. So he's working out this deal to, to trade prisoners of war. And there's several times, I'll never, there's like the one thing I especially remember about the movie, that like at least three times throughout this movie, Tom Hanks looks at the guy that he's supposed to defend and he says, aren't you worried? To which the Soviet spy always responds, would it help? <laughs> Every time, would it help? Right? To a certain extent, it does and can help. If something is important and is threatened in some way, it can help you to plan wisely and to be concerned for others in a Christ-like way. But eventually, worrying gets to a point where it doesn't help anymore, and it can eventually become idolatrous and paralyzing and eat us up inside, right? It says, Charles Spurgeon once said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. And how often do we know that? It doesn't do anything to change tomorrow, but it makes me really tired and stressed out today, and I have no strength for today now. And so what are you worrying about these days that you need to entrust to your heavenly Father? Is it the finances? Is it your health? Is it your children? Is it your job? Is it a relationship with someone else? Is it whether you will find a spouse someday? Is it a national crisis? Is it the loss of a loved one? Well, let us not be anxious about tomorrow, but trust our Heavenly Father's good providence. Let God worry about your future and trust that His grace will be sufficient to sustain you no matter what tomorrow may bring. Remember that as Lamentations 3 put it, His mercies are new every morning. And as Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And just before that, he says, he reminds us of God's care for all of his creation. And if he cares for the lesser things of his creation, he says, how much more will he care for us who are his image bearers and his beloved children in Christ? I love how our catechism puts it when it says, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature will separate us from His love. For all creatures are so completely in His hand that without His will they can neither move nor be moved. You see, God is both sovereign and good. We know not what the future holds, but we know who holds it. And it's the one who did not spare His only Son, but freely gave Him up for us on the cross. And so as Paul asks, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things. And so in light of this wonderful doctrine of providence revealed in God's word, let us be patient in adversity. Let us be thankful in prosperity and let us be confident in our good and sovereign heavenly Father for our future. Amen. Let's pray. Dear heavenly Father, we thank you for your word once again and how what wonderful, sweet, and precious promises we have in your word that you are good and sovereign and that you love us and that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Father, help us then to uh, trust you each and every day and uh, to respond with patient uh, trust and to be thankful in prosperity and to be confident and to know that our ultimate, our ultimate circumstance is in Christ and in the new heavens and new earth and that this slight and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. And we pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come, quickly come again and wipe away all tears from our eyes. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I would like to uh, pronounce a benediction upon you now, if you'd like to stand and uh, from Numbers uh, chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And go in peace.